welcome back to this channel so um have you ever had a period where you felt like you no longer dream and if you look at if you reflect you feel like you've never dreamed at all at all and you're sure about it surprise to you uh it's been fun that when you dream sometimes you don't get to remember it and it's a fact that um 60% of people who report never dreaming are found out to be to have really to have dreamed but cannot remember and sometimes also it's also uh it can also be that you only remember a little percentage of what you dreamed and the rest you forget and have you ever wondered when you are dreaming that you cannot read exactly what what is in the dreams especially if it's a note you can never get to get the real uh like words in the dream uh, think about it so uh today i want us to talk about two types of dreams that is lucid dreams and hypnagogic hallucinations and when i say hypnagogic hallucinations these are not just pure hallucinations these are dreams real dreams that you have but most people have found them very disturbing and it makes them uh, remain in a state of confusion wondering whether they are sick or uh, they're just normal so um i want to look at these two dreams and so that you can be able to identify the differences and also know deeply about what they really are so i'll start with lucid dreams so when you talk about lucid, lucid dreams what are they so lucid, lucid dreams are when you know that you are dreaming while you are asleep you are aware that you are dreaming but you are asleep uh the events that are flashing through your brain aren't really happening but the dream feels vivid and real you may even be able to control how the actions unfold and it may feel like you are in a, a movie you are directing it but then you are in a, you, are, you are deep asleep so when exactly do these lucid dreams happen lucid dreams are most common during rapid eye movement period of sleep uh, something we call the rem sleep uh, during uh, a period this is a period of uh, deep sleep marked by eye motion fast breathing and more brain activity it has always been thought that dreams could only happen during the uh, during the rem sleep but lucid dreams may also happen just outside the uh, the rem sleep so the non rem sleep dreams may have a pseudo quality that allows the dreamer to distance himself from what he's dreaming so when you having dreams within the rem sleep sometimes you might not have that much control of what's happening but when you have uh, dreams outside of the rem sleep uh, you can always uh, discriminate on what is going on inside that inside that dream so usually enter rem sleep about 90 minutes after falling asleep it lasts about uh, like 10 minutes as you sleep each period is longer than the one before um but they probably don't happen often usually uh, only a handful of times in a year so that is when we're talking about the lucid dreams so it's not that every day that you get to have the lucid dreams and you can only have that a few times in a uh, in a year so lucid dreams the, the research that has been done on lucid dreams is, isn't that much conclusive but the ideas fronted uh, borders on the physical differences in the brains of people who do have the lucid dreams and those who don't have lucid dreams so the very part of the brain i call the prefront, prefrontal cortex that is on the uh, front side that one 
uh, it's the site of high level of tasks like making decisions and recalling memories. It is bigger in people who have uh, lucid dreams. That suggests that folks who folks of people who are most likely to have lucid dreams are uh, people who tend to self reflect a lot and these self reflective types uh, chew over their thoughts uh, in their head so much and when you do that the the fragments of memories that will remain that might end up being what turning into lucid dreams as you go to sleep so <coughs> what are the benefits of lucid dreams lucid dreams might be might help somebody uh, in their life and I know it sounds a bit sketchy but when you have these lucid dreams you get to have less anxiety that is one uh, the sense of control you feel during a, a dream may stay with you and make uh, make you feel empowered when you are awake and you can shape the story and the, the ending. So that might serve as remedy for people who have nightmares, teaching them how to control their dreams. And when you are able to have this kind of control, you tend to have less anxiety when you wake up and maybe when you are facing something that you, that always uh, feel like threatening to you. Uh, the second way lucid dreams can help someone is by bettering their motor, uh, their motor skills. So, in some studies, it has been suggested that it may be possible to improve simple things like tapping your fingers. So, you find that because lucid dreams might are that much vivid, you might feel like you're trying to maybe grab onto something and when you're doing that in sleep you'll find that you might not really grab but you might end up tapping your fingers so when you're doing that uh, you find that it helps you in improving your what your motor skills because these are things that you can remember when you are awake and you can apply them in real life situations um, the, th the third benefit of lucid dreams is that it can improve in problem solving. So there is evidence that uh, lucid dreams can help people solve problems that deal with creativity, like uh, conflict with another person. It can help you resolve a conflict with another person. But the same cannot be said about uh, logic, logical stuff, maybe like uh, solving a, a mathematical problem. So it can help you in problem solving, but not ones that need that require logic but the ones that uh, require creativity to be applied so um, that uh, the last maybe the last point on benefits of dreams is that it can add you more creativity I know I've talked about creativity but people who have uh, pe people who have been uh, subjected to experiments with dreams, uh, they have proved that at one point they were able to come up with new ideas or insights, sometimes with the help of characters in their, in their dreams. So, uh, talking of this, when we talk about the biggest, uh, can I say internet company, but Google, there's one time that Larry Page said that it came about as a result of a dream. So from that dream, Google was born. And that is what I mean when I say that uh, lucid dreams can help somebody to be more creative. So having look at, looked at the benefits of lucid dreams, I want also to uh, throw in some dangers of lucid dreams. So lucid dreams, may also cause problems uh, that includes less sleep quality 
So due to the vivid nature of the dreams, you can they can end up waking you up and make it hard to get back to sleep. So uh, you get to understand that the scary nature of some of the dreams that you might have might interfere with your focus. So when you wake up, you end up not getting back to sleep that easily. And remember that the nature of the dreams might disturb you and you might not be able to think about sleep again. Yeah. So um, another danger of lucid dreams is that it can bring confusion. Uh, it can also result into delirium and hallucinations in people who have certain mental health disorders. And uh, lucid dreams may blur the line between what is real and what is imagined. So people who have mental health issues, they, some, some of them, some of the symptoms may include hallucinations. And if they get to have these lucid dreams, they may, they might end up, it might end up uh, exacerbating their problems because they might not be able to differentiate between what is real, real and what is not real, what is imagined in their, in their head. So that is, uh, those are the dangers of um, lucid dreams. So having talked about uh, lucid dreams, I want us also to look at hypnagogic hallucinations. What are hypnagogic hallucinations? Uh, they are vivid and sometimes frightening hallucinations that occur in the setting of, uh, in the onset of sleep. And these ones are a little bit scary. So uh, before talking about this in maybe in details, I want us to look about. Uh, I want us to look at some illustration. So this is a this is a, a case study from um, a book I found online. Uh, it's called The Principles and Practice of uh, Sleep Medicine. Uh, it was fourth edition, published in two thousand five by the likes of Antonio Zadra. So this. They said this case of a, a woman, at age 19, she was raped. By the time uh, she was kidnapped, that, sorry, by the time she was uh, giving the story, she was 36. So before getting to sleep, she, was, uh, she developed something we call PTSD. And when she was abducted, at that age of 19, uh, they took her for more than three days. Uh, they raped her, they, be, uh, they beat her, they burned her, and also subjected the lady to death threats. Um, for those of you who watch movies, you've ever seen this game, it's called the Russian Roulette. Uh, you, you, you put a bullet in, inside the pistol and then you roll and then you try to, to shoot. So if you are lucky, you won't be blasted, your brains won't be blasted, but if you are unlucky, you find that you are never sure if the bullet is going to come out and hit your brain, hit your head, or if it you'll be lucky that it won't shoot. So she was uh, subjected to all this by, the, by a motorcycle gang who kidnapped, who kidnapped her. And although she regularly re-experienced these uh, horrors through flashbacks and nightmares, uh, even worse were they uh, hypnagogic hallucinations and in this case they are classified as terrifying hypnagogic hallucinations and she felt as if though she were awake uh, she felt like she was aroused and terrified yet unable to move time seemed to be extremely uh, 
drone. So this sort of experience staff kept on replaying on her head. So it felt almost as torturous as it was uh, in real life when she was going through that. So things in this instance felt like they were going in slow motion. And so this is an illustration of what comes when you are having hypnagogic hallucinations. So terrifying hypnagogic hallucinations are terrifying dreams similar to those in REM sleep. After a sudden awakening at sleep onset, that is only, uh, when you are going to sleep, you felt asleep a bit, but then you wake up suddenly. Uh, you find that that is when it's more likely that you get the hypnagogic or terrifying hypnagogic hallucinations. So um, there is prompt recall of the threatening content. Sleep onset REM dreams or episodes may be aggravated by factors uh, that predispose someone to this type of sleep. For example, withdrawal from REM sleep suppressant medications, um, chronic sleep deprivation, sleep fragmentation, and narcolepsy. So if somebody have or has these predisposing factors, they might be more prone to experiencing hypnagogic hallucinations. Other sleep and medical disorders may accompany the condition. Clinical and anecdotal reports suggest that uh, the themes of attack and aggression found in REM sleep uh, nightmares are also common. Here in uh, terrifying hypnagogic hallucinations are perhaps more anxiety provoking than uh, most nightmare because one, in, in terrifying hypnagogic hallucinations, a vivid sense of reality related to their close proximity to wakefulness uh, make it more hard to draw the line between real and imagined. And then two, the things that happen in the dreams are uh, mostly or sometimes or frequently um, are associated with feelings of paralysis. So this is where you see things happening, you feel them happening, but you can't do anything. So it's like you, you, you see those dreams where you dream like you are falling in a very deep hole, but you don't seem to be able to, even if, however much you shout, you can't seem to be able to release that sound from your vocals. So that is some kind of uh, how these hypnagogic hallucinations come about. But um, when talking about hallucinations, we have the visual uh, aspect of it. We have the auditory aspect of it. We also have the tactile, that is uh, those things that you feel. Sometimes we call them the somatic hallucinations. Then we have the gustatory, that has to do with uh, the scent, then we have the olfactory, and then we have the kinetic. So uh, I want us to look at some of the ways that these aspects of hallucination can come about in hypnagogic hallucinations. So um, starting with visuals, I, I can give examples of uh, you feel like someone or something uh, present in the room simple elementary forms such as maybe sparks or lines, flashes and shadows. Then there is complex forms of visual uh, hallucinations in hypnagogic hallucinations that come in the form of waterfalls or animals, known or unknown people or faces. Uh, you can feel like they are you can feel like they are thieves or soldiers and lifelike uh, scenes in the hypnagogic dreams. And then when we come to auditory, um, there are also examples like you feel like there are footsteps, 
or you can see explosions you can feel like there are shots a beep from a cell phone um, voices of known or unknown people familiar or unfamiliar songs can also be playing in the background the auditory and the visual uh, modalities of hallucinations are more common uh, because most people report seeing or hearing things in their dreams. So we have uh, varied presentations depending on the population group in which they are studied or these dreams are uh, uh, reported. So when, for example, hallucinations are prominent in people with schizophrenia spectrum disorders, Parkinson's disease, and eye disease, in which they are known as uh, uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome. So it's showing a distinct character. So when you look at uh, these dreams, or maybe these hallucinations, you find that people with these conditions that have uh, mentioned, like the Charles Bonnet syndrome, they tend to have visual and auditory hallucinations. And uh, when they are added to hypnagogic hallucinations, they now become even more terrifying. So I'll move ahead and talk about the tactile, which I said can also be called uh, somatic hallucinations. Uh, the examples are like uh, someone grabbing you when you're asleep. Uh, you feel like bugs are crawling on your skin. You can feel tingling in your body, or you can generally experience pain. That, but remember, even if you're feeling this pain, it is a dream. It's not happening in real sense. Then, uh, talking about gustatory hallucinations, uh, you might taste like you might feel like uh, some metallic taste in your mouth, or generally you just get a funny taste in your mouth, yeah. And then we have the olfactory hallucinations. So the examples of, of uh, olfactory hallucinations, uh, you can feel maybe familiar perfumes or uh, scents. Then you can feel maybe cologne. Uh, some people report feeling uh, the smell of feces. Uh, some also get to feel the smell of smoke and experiences uh, may, uh, may vary depending on the individual and what has been going on in their life. And so I'll move on to the kinetic hallucinations. So in kinetic hallucinations, these ones are rarely felt, but some people report having them especially in people who have uh, other conditions like narcolepsy. So in kinetic hallucinations, you get uh, to feel like someone, uh, someone may feel like they are floating, they feel like maybe they are flying, they feel like they are jumping into a deep hole, they feel like uh, they are falling, or they feel like they are out of body, so when you're feeling out of, like you're out of body, uh, which we call out of body experiences, you feel like you are levitated or you are levitating. Yeah. So most of the people who experience hypnagogic hallucinations know that the perceptions are not true and do not exist, despite very vivid and real, and maybe experienced as, uh, they may experience these things as, as, as unpleasant and threatening and hard to distinguish from true events. So kinetic hallucinations are so bizarre, they may, um, they may lead to paranormal beliefs or be mistaken for delusional psychosis. That's why uh, in the beginning I said that hypnagogic hallucinations might be a little bit confusing and very threatening and they might threaten somebody's uh, mental well-being. So 
The hallucinations uh, may present the individual experiencing them with a kind of suffering, and the suffering during such episodes is exacerbated uh, by the individual's simultaneous sense of wakefulness and inability to move or call for help. Um, the, the intense anxiety may seriously disrupt sleep. For example, recurrent terrifying hypnagogic hallucinations may disrupt sleep onset uh, sufficient, sufficiently uh, to produce sleep onset insomnia. So people who have, most people who have terrifying hypnagogic hallucinations may find it very hard to fall asleep because of the, the intensity of the anxiety that these uh, dreams or these hallucinations cause. So remember that uh, this video is for educational purposes. So do not rush to saying that uh, because I've had maybe some kind of uh, hypnagogic hallucination once, now I'm losing it mentally. No. Remember what I said that uh, people might develop some kind of what? Some kind of uh, paranormal beliefs or they might confuse the terrifying hypnagogic hallucinations for delusional psychosis. So I hope you can now be able to differentiate between the two types of dreams and having said something on hypnagogic hallucinations, I said that these are dreams that come at the onset of sleep. But they are also the opposite of hypnagogic hallucinations uh, is called hypnopompic hallucinations and these ones come at the onset of waking. So that period when you are asleep all night but then in the morning you wake up and then for one reason or another you fall asleep again and then wake up. So during that small period you find that you, really, you can have very intense dreams. Those are the ones that we call the hypnopompic hallucinations. And uh, up to this point, I'm hopeful that you've learned the difference between the two dreams and the, the hypnagogic hallucinations and the lucid dreams. And you can stop confusing whether you are uh, normal or not normal. So I hope this video was helpful to you. If you like, if you find this the information useful, please uh, share it with others. Do not forget to like, and if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe. And you can also leave a comment. Tell us, uh, tell me what you would like to hear more from this channel, and uh, I would really appreciate. So bye bye, and see you next time.